Way back in 2002, I was driving our son Christopher to Russellville, Alabama so he could take the ACT test. I'll never forget a street sign I saw, believe it or not, it was called Stuck Street. You say, I know, in Alabama they're going to have a stuck street. But at least they were honest enough to admit it. In Jesus' time, the Pool of Bethesda was Stuck Street. And there were people there lying along the side, waiting and hoping and wishing that somehow if that water would move, they could be the first one in and all their maladies would be taken away. One man, 38 years ill, whom Jesus met and asked the most basic question, do you want to get well? And then he told him to take up his mat and walk. And that sign is given just like all the others in the fourth gospel so that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and have life through his name and get off of Stuck Street and live on the highway to heaven. Wonderful opportunity we have with PTP 365. We'll mention this just one more time today. If you go to 365.polishingthepulpit.com and enter the username and password there, you'll have access to almost an infinite number of Bible lessons, faith-building messages about parenting and family and leadership and faithfulness and those things that will strengthen your walk with God. Just a few moments, I'd like to tell you about some exciting news we heard over the weekend from halfway across the world. But first, let's go to John chapter 5. And perhaps that area looked something like this. In fact, tonight, as we look at rocks of ages, archaeological discoveries that illuminate and inform and verify our conviction that the Bible is the Word of God, this evening we'll go to the pool of Bethesda and see the remains there. And if you'd like to have a rock-solid faith on which you can base your life, be with us this evening at 5 o'clock and every time we meet. Right now, I'll ask you a question that we'll answer tonight. How could a pool have five covered porticos, colonnades or rows of columns as we read in John 5? We'll discover that this evening. This is the third of Jesus' signs. And you notice again his one-to-one -one offer, his kindness, his approachability. Even with a crowd, he sees the need and the concern and the burden, the fears and doubts of all those around him. Let's compare that pool to our world today, a microcosm, a miniature glimpse of what exists all around us. Because you see, it was during a feast, likely the Passover, that Jesus was there by the sheep gate, place where they would have brought the sacrifices in, going back to David Hurt's fine remarks about the Lord's Supper. And perhaps they would have washed some of the animals in this area that were about to be offered. Tonight I'll show you exactly where the Pool of Bethesda was located. But here we find a multitude of people with all kinds of infirmities and disabilities, paralysis. They're withered, they're lame, they're blind, and they're sick. Brothers and sisters, that's our world without Jesus Christ. Aimless, hopeless, helpless, together with others and not even realizing that there's a life that Jesus Christ can give. You see, people are only at that pool. They're only on Stuck Street because they haven't yet recognized that Jesus Christ gives life and victory and purpose and freedom. Would you stay there one minute longer than you had to? Of course not. These people are desperate. They're discouraged. They're frustrated. They're resentful. They're irritable. You can even tell when Jesus asks the man and he comes back and he says, I have no one to help me into the pool. Someone else always makes it there first. And this acid, this bitterness, this unhappiness, and it's all around. It's what they experience together. They can't enjoy their family. They can't be with their friends. They can't 
worship in a setting like we enjoy. They can't know forgiveness and life and mobility and the opportunity to serve to the glory of God. You see, they're on Stuck Street there at that pool, sharing their misery with all the rest. And they're putting their hope in these waters with the idea that the first one in the pool would somehow become well. If your Bible includes John 5 and verse 4, or you may have it in brackets, it's simply not present in the earliest manuscripts, and yet it seems to be what the people thought was true. If the water started moving, they had this idea that there was an angel stirring it up, and oh boy, first one in the pool gets well. And so they're anxious waiting for something we might say that never happened because if it did there wouldn't be a crowd at the pool the place would be empty because one would be gone and then another and another but the fact that this man's been ill for 38 years and he still thinks I could just get in that water no end days pass and weeks and months and years they could just reach that water. That's where they think the answer lies. But it doesn't because it goes on and on and on. And you can imagine that if the water did move a bit, who would be the first one in the pool? The least ill. The one most capable and mobile jumps into the water and maybe says, I'm healed of some inconsequential thing. And then that just increases the misery. And then there's the jealousy, the competition, the rivalry. Because I didn't get there in time. And it's because nobody else will help me. And this man is consumed with his own pain, with his struggles, with his despair, with his poison within. Isn't it instructive that Jesus would come to the pool of Bethesda and would see that man and know that he's been ill for such a long time and would offer him what the pool could not give him. And that was the ability to arise and take that mat which had been that on which he slept and show it to the world and carry for all to see. John chapter 5 is a picture of evangelism. It shows the emptiness, the pain, the downtrodden experience that Jesus could alleviate, that he could remedy, that he could take away. And yet, people keep thinking about those magic waters. If, if I just had more money, there's always somebody getting more money than I have. They're first. They got the job. They got the house. They got whatever the possession may be. Or if I were just more popular, or if I were better looking, or if I were younger, if I could change this circumstance, and it's that rat on the wheel just running faster and faster and faster, and we may be lost, but we're making great time, right? And when we see ourselves and we see our neighbors and we see our relatives and friends at the Pool of Bethesda on Stuck Street, then we want to do what Jesus does as he enters that area. First thing that Jesus did, I believe, was he had a prior aim to save. That's why he came, Luke 19.10, to seek and to save that which was lost. He didn't just stumble onto something. This was his intent. This was his focus. This was his desire. What about you and me? Do you aim to save? Will you begin tomorrow morning praying, Lord, lead me to some soul today. Teach me, Lord, just what to say. Friends of mine are lost in sin and cannot find their way. The more we become like Jesus, the more we realize there are people at the pool of Bethesda. And unless somebody goes and talks to them and offers them life, they're going to be stranded there. They're going to continue there. 
And so they will die and meet the Lord. I should mention, lest I forget, that there's a Bethesda, Maryland. And there's a Bethesda Naval Hospital there. And many U.S. presidents and other people have been treated at the Bethesda Naval Hospital. Where did that name come from? Well, it comes from this place. It's also odd that Bethesda means house of mercy in Hebrew, and that's what the people were hoping for. And one more thing, after the first century passed, the pagans of Rome started a healing place there, like you come to the fountain, it's the fountain of youth. Everything will be right if you just come to this Asclepion. There was a Greek god, Asclepius. And the promise was, if you just come to this pool, Asclepius will meet you there and you will be healed. None of that was true. And Jesus approaches the scene. Oh, it's so easy for you and me to stay just with the 99 sheep. Fellowship, associate with, eat with, talk with, be with, work with those that are already in Christ. But if we do that, who's going to the pool? Who will visit Stuck Street? And we have to realize that Jesus intentionally went to a place where it was full of sick people, angry, miserable, complaining, mean, and upset. We shy away, perhaps. We may retreat. We may engage with those that are like us, that love God and worship God and serve God, not Jesus. And then he assessed the situation. Did you see where John wrote? He knew that the man had been ill for a long time. Jesus knows what hurts the heart. When people are bereaved or have a cancer diagnosis, or they lose their best friend, or some promise that was made is broken. Jesus identifies with those whose lives aren't working. People that have fallen, people that have failed. Don't we see this is a picture of the incarnation, of the Lord leaving heaven, the glory and the splendor and the majesty, where he never had to encounter people like this, and he chose to give it all up. So he could come to the pool of Bethesda, which is the world. And he could meet people like we would be if we didn't know Jesus. And those that live in our state and in our nation and across the world. And he took the time to be aware of what was going on in people's lives. He wasn't content simply with the fact that he was healthy. He was focused on this man. 38 years. Can you... Grasp that. Wonder who carried him and set him there. And he had that mat. How long had he used it? What did it smell like? What did he smell like? What did he look like? There's so much we're not told. His name, his circumstances, his family. We're just told he has nothing. He has nothing. And Jesus is going to do for him what those waters could not and had not. We can do the same thing. We've talked in our Sunday night series that we titled To the Rescue about initiating conversation with a question. Those open questions, what do you think about or believe about? And then the closed yes or no question, which is this one. And his is so basic. Do you want to get well? Well, of course. Why is this person at the pool? And yet Jesus pointed out and drew out of that man the response that he would make. Well, you heard as Steve read, he said, no one will help me into the pool. Someone else gets in there first. Jesus could have gone into that. He could have taken that detour and discussed, oh, this is what people think, but bum, bum, bum. He doesn't. There's no delay. There's no speculation. There's no endless argument here. Jesus just tells the man, get up and take your mat and walk. There's something for him to do 
in order to access what Jesus offers. And if the man says, no, I think I'll just sit here. It's been a while. I don't really have confidence. I'm not going to try. You know, this is my routine. I'm in this rut. Go on. And there are people that are like that. He has to make a decision. Will he react or will he stay put? When you and I talk to people about Christ, first we have the aim to save. And then we approach the scene. And then we assess the situation. And then we ask the need-based question that has to do with life and forgiveness and salvation and eternity with God. And then we call for the response. And in our case, it's arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on his name. Acts twenty two sixteen. 16. Repent, be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 2 and verse 38. But there's a step that only this man can take. But you know what? He's not able to take that step without the Lord's help. He's on Stuck Street. He can't move. He has to be placed there and lifted and taken back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And all these others are in the very same situation. And so for him to do what he does next is an act of faith. But that's not all. That mat that was the sign of his weakness is now his billboard. And he becomes what we might call a visual aid Christian, follower of Jesus. He's one that's now going to let the world see what's happened in his life. And that which he once depended on, he no longer needs. It's the same with the children of God today. We take our mat and we walk and we let others see that we're not the person we used to be. And it's not about us or because of us. It's all focused on Him. I was blind, but now I see. I was lame, but now I walk. I was dead, but now I'm alive. Let me show you the one who did this for me. How often... The New Testament talks about this new walk. Ephesians 4, starting at verse 1, urges us to walk in a manner worthy of our high and holy calling. Ephesians 4, 17, walk no longer as the Gentiles, that is, the pagans in the futility of their mind. Their hearts are calloused and they're not willing to listen. Their eyes are darkened because they won't open them to see. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, by grace you're saved through faith. It's a gift of God to have eternal life. Not of yourselves. You can't boast about it. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance that we should walk in them. Ephesians 2, 10. We speak of talking the talk and walking the walk. Let me ask you something as I ask myself, can people tell by the way I walk? that I love the Lord, that I'm a new creature, that I'm no longer stuck at that pool, that things are different and fresh and vibrant. Can they see in my face the joy and the peace? Can they recognize the Spirit of God in my heart by the way I go about my work and the way I talk with others and the way I treat my wife or husband and our children and those whom we meet? The man was asked, who is it that healed you? And John goes on to say, he didn't know. Jesus had moved on. And so that's an amazing thing, that he responded without full information about the Lord's identity. This is verse uh, 12. Who is the man that said to you, pick up your bed and walk? The man who was healed did not know who it was. Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in their place. See the Savior not seeking the limelight, not waiting around to take glory for what he had done. But now look at verse 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said, Behold, you become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. 
Jesus is not necessarily saying that the man's previous condition was the result of sin. The Bible distinguishes those two often, though physical problems can come from sin. What he does affirm for sure is that the consequences of sin are deadlier and costlier and more permanent than spending 38 years sick at the pool of Bethesda. He's saying to him and to us, you think that was bad. There's something you can hardly even compare if you live in sin. There's a paralysis. Now there's a death. Now there's a hopelessness that far exceeds anything that you have been through. And that helps us understand something else. Why didn't Jesus heal all the people at the pool of Bethesda? You ever wonder that? A multitude. Why didn't you just go from one? Why didn't he clean out the place? He could have. And the Gospels note certain scenes in which they brought to him all who were ill in a certain village. And he cured them all. But what he's trying to do with this one man is to show for all the others to know there's something that outlasts physical disease, even that which is terminal, and that is the consequences of sin. And this man now carrying his mat, notice what happens next, verse 15. He went away and told the Jews it was Jesus that made him well. Who forced him to do that? Nobody. He couldn't hold it in. Oh, brothers and sisters, if I, if we could have such a conviction that we were at that pool, we were on Stuck Street, and we're the ones that Jesus rescued. Take out that mat. Let others see it. Who is it? Well, let me find out more information. It's Jesus. Let me tell you about Jesus. And I am who I am. Because Jesus met me at the pool and told me to take up my mat. And I'm going to turn from sin. Why? Because something much worse will befall me if I practice sin. So what is the man to do? The fact is, it's the Sabbath day. And so the critics will come and say, you can't do this. We consider this work. And in verse 11, that tremendous connection he makes. The one who made me well told me to do it. And that's all I need to hear. Not the Pharisees' traditions, not their restrictions, not their man-made interpretations. I have met Jesus, and Jesus said, do it. And I'm going to do it. Oh, I want that conviction. Don't you? I don't want to hide my mat. I don't want to act as if I'm like the people around me. I want on every occasion for others to see that Jesus has met me on Stuck Street at the Pool of Bethesda. And now I have something to share. And it's not about me or you. It's all about Him. Over the weekend, we heard from our brother Bob Burkle. The scene here is at the Glefada Church of Christ in Athens, Greece. And it's a Friday night gathering. The building is full of Muslim refugees. And going back to the crisis in the Middle East that prompted some of these refugees to leave, over 250 have left Islam and have been baptized into Jesus Christ. It's this past Friday night, and Dino Russos, the preacher there, and then they had some 60 speakers that could talk in Farsi. The people of Iran and Afghanistan, that's their language. That church, Glyphada, has services in English and in Greek and in Russian <laughs> and Bible study in Farsi. We see that this is the pool of Bethesda. We see that the world is filled with refugees, spiritually speaking. They're homeless and in need. That are lost. And that which these Muslims have never heard, and that is the love of God. 
and the sacrifice of his son and the forgiveness of his sins. Can't you see them getting up from that room and going wherever they're headed next, showing their mat and saying, it was Jesus. It was Jesus that made me well. Bob said that at least one from Afghanistan is now a distance learning student with Sunset International Biblical Institute. He's going to be preaching the gospel in Afghanistan and to the people from his country. Why? Because through this outreach, the Savior was introduced to people at the pool and they heard something that lifted them up that drew them to the, the house of mercy, Beth Esda, the, the true house of mercy, the kingdom of God. And all that they'd heard before was driving them down and down and down. And then when they learned about Jesus, they responded. You know what it makes me think? All of us are at the pool of Bethesda somewhere. There could be people here today just going through that same old despair, frustration. You're guilty, you're afraid, you're burdened with sin, and it just seems to be no end. And it seems that all the people in your life, perhaps, have the same burdens and barriers. And Jesus is coming to you today through John chapter 5, and he's asking you this question. Do you want to get well? Maybe you're like this man bitter, irritable, upset because of what's gone on before, but you have just enough faith that when Jesus says, be baptized, you'll get up. Hey, he set me free. Maybe you'll be the one to take that mat tomorrow, figuratively, and let the world see the Savior that came to you. Or it could be, I know you wouldn't do this, but there are those that are like those Pharisees pulling well, their arms. They're not even excited that the man is well. All they can do is find fault and criticize. We did this on Sabbath day. That's against our rules. You wouldn't be like that. Or you and I could be like Jesus, looking for the pool of Bethesda in which there are people whom we can impact and teach and ask a need-based question and offer life in Jesus Christ. We've already described the gospel and his invitation. Won't you come as we stand and sing?